David versus Goliath comes back to the country. That's powerful. Today we have Dr. Roberto or Roberto Dr. Sintley Rodriguez. Correct, Dr. Rodriguez? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, Dr. Rodriguez has a PhD in mass communication, and he is with us today to talk about a study that, is, that with regard to um, the um, brown Rasa communities here in the United States, um, with regard to police shootings, and we're going to go over so, some issues. But before we get going, viewers, Go to Buena News if you you could be watching this from whatever device you're using and subscribe to 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 our channel. Uh, we have a lot of, of great episodes that um, that we've been taping. And today with Dr. Sintley, um, I'm looking forward to 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 interview. And again, Dr. Sintley, thank you for uh, for for, jo for joining us today. Before we get going, could you give us a little bit um, about your background, where you're teaching, what's your focus on? And I think folks would like to know what your dissertation is on as well. Uh, yes, I, uh, I teach at the University of Arizona in the Department of Mexican-American Studies. Um, I got my master's and PhD at the University of Wisconsin in mass communications. Um, I spent an entire career as a journalist, as a columnist, um, and returned to the university after 29 years to get my, again, the master's and PhD. The dissertation was on maize and maize culture. I was examining the, the topic of origins and migrations. And um, I know many people probably, or some people have read, uh, what, be, what was my dissertation, it became a book called Our Sacred Maize is Our Mother. Uh, so that's a big part of what I do even to this day. Um, but I also have two other areas of re research. Uh, one resulted in another book called Yorki, A Warrior Summoned from the Spirit World. And that has to do with police or law enforcement violence. Um, and again, that's also something that I continue to research. And that one I've been doing since 1979, um, when I was almost killed by L.A. sheriffs uh, way back. You know, it was the opening night of Boulevard Nights. Anyway, that's how far back it goes. The third topic is on color and color consciousness. Um, it's a project I've been working on. Uh, so those are the three basic uh, projects. So yes, maize culture, violence, and color and color consciousness. Dr. Seedley, um, just so the audience knows, where, where are you zooming in from today? Well, I'm uh, near Mexico City. Um, I, uh, I'm close to the pyramids of Teotihuacan, you know, and uh, an incredible place. Um, my original plan was not to be here, but rather to be traveling throughout Mexico and Guatemala doing research. But because of the pandemic, uh, I can't really do that. I think now it's opening up and I will be able to do that starting in a month or so. But it's a it's been a great place to be stuck. Because so, so for so for the audience, our, our goal today is is that is to look at the preliminary at the preliminary findings of the Rasa data database research. And in the conversation, especially for viewers to understand some of the topics that we're going to, to, to hit on. And we encourage, if you're a faculty member in any departments, but specifically in, in any Chicano and Chicano Studies Department, Rasa Study, Mexican-American Studies, Latino Studies, you know, we think this interview is going to be important to hit on certain topics, but we're going to hit on issues of invisibility of, of, of Latino Rasa communities in the United States, issues of media, uh, Chicano, Chicano, Brown, and other Latin American um, academics and, and, and what are some next steps and action items along with, again, looking at, at, at action items from what Dr. Seatley and some of the research, um, especially because here in Los Angeles, you had the LA Times reporter Gustavo Arriano, you know, who, who's in a lot of folks using some of your research. So can you, can you give us a few of your, of your bullet points, like brown people's rasa, are virtually invisible, invisibilized by the national media and government. So if you're, if you're listening, what do you mean by we are invisible? 
The history of violence against Mexican, um, and you know, we use the word Latinos, right, when we're talking about broader. Right, but it's a panel. Yeah, but the, but the violence that I studied primarily is directed against Mexican origin peoples, and now increasingly Central Americans, because I think they get confused for being Mexicanos, you know, <laughs> by law enforcement. Uh, in other words, it isn't a new topic. It's something long-standing, and it, uh, personally, I track all this violence to 1492, but we're, right now, I'm going to talk to you about 1848 or the 1830s. That is, the whole Texas, that war, that war of independence, and, and then, of course, the Mexican-American War, you know, after the war, Mexicanos still own the land, for the most part. So how did they not own the land, you know, in a generation or two? That was through violence, you know, through lynchings, uh, mass deportations, you know, once you get into the 20th century. So you have a, a history of violence that is not new. And uh, unfortunately, as like I mentioned, well, no, I've not mentioned it yet, but in my study, I tried to go back as far as I could. And that's why I said I, my conclusion was the violence we're looking at is you can trace it to 1492, specifically the concept of hum humanization or dehumanization. That is, that choke that happened in 1492, it was like, who is human and who is not? And that is still with us to this very day. Because when Cortes landed, same issue there. You know, that is, how can you make someone a slave or how can you take land away? The only way you can do that is if you see them as not human. And so all those years of colonialism, now they were only talking about the U.S. in the 1840s or 1830s when you're talking about Texas. The history of lynchings, the history of the Texas Rangers, that violence. And then, if, if, so the lynching goes from the 1840s to the 1920s. I forget if maybe a few in the 1930s, but definitely the 20s. And, you know, most people, if they've heard of lynchings, they might associate that with African Americans. The lynchings of African Americans pretty much began in the 1860s. So you're so what we're talking about here is that 20 years prior to that, to de, to what we other uh, in other countries they call ethnic cleansing, that's what had to take place to be able to steal the land. So you have a continuous history going into the 20s, and then of course those mass deportations after the Mexican uh, Revolution. But I think you had a question. Yes, Dr. Singley. So in, in, in the in the in, in, we're going to get into where folks will be able to see some of the information that you're coming up with. But you, you have a point in some of the preliminary information that you mentioned. You said a large percentage of the killings in the greater southwest are brown peoples and predominantly of Mexican origin and also increasingly of Central American origin. Now, you've had a significant amount of, of killings of folks who are Mexican American brown skinned Central American, specifically the killings in, in El Paso, where the killer specifically said that he was looking for Mexicans. Now, but, but what I'm not seeing is that connection between understanding the killings of folks that may be considered Mexican because of their brown skin and, and the mass media understanding that they are racialized. And, and, and that, that nexus doesn't seem to be occurring in media. And, and I'm asking you why. Well, there's three things to consider before even answering that question, because you mentioned the concept of racialization. Okay, So racialization takes place, one, visual, you know, so that could be skin color, phenotype, etc. But also, and this is important for law enforcement, it's like when they pull somebody over, they already know that they have a Lopez, you know, or a Garcia, right? Because they run a make, you know? And so last names are also racialized, you know? So now if they pull somebody over and they speak Spanish, the language is also racialized, you know? So it's kind of even a broader mm. aspect because it isn't simply they see somebody, but rather in the process, they speak Spanish, I mean, automatically. So you already have this dynamic taking place. Um, but give me that question again because I, I had to make those three points and I, I no thank you what, what what I'm saying is that is that you, oh, you, yes. you, you you have killings that are specifically targeted 
yeah. against Mexican American populations or folks that may be considered they may be Central American and 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 specifically targeted. And that idea of of the brown population, whether Mexican American, Central American, being specifically targeted, doesn't seem to be able to get in the heads of mass media. Yeah, and remember that that's that's my field of study, mass communications. And so I, I personally have studied that precisely. Like, if you have hundreds, thousands, you know, and we'll get to the specific numbers in a little bit, but we're not talking about small numbers. We're talking about huge numbers, right? So why are those numbers not being reported? Why are the cases not being reported? And I think the answer is the equivalent of all of the above. But one of, one of the answers is that in this country, you know, I don't know how far back it goes because it should never have been this way, but it has been the idea of a black and white society, a black and white binary, you know? Everything's black and white, you know? Literally and metaphorically, you know? And so government works that way, you know, black and white, and, and we kind of don't fit in there. And there's no standard and there's no centralization on this topic. So Texas may label people a certain way, New Mexico might la label them differently. California might label them different also. So, so there you have a problem where um, if the media is predisposed or conditioned to report everything in black and white, uh, in some cases they'll literally refer to us as white, you know? Kind of like, it's kind of very lazy, right? Because that way it stays black and white, you know? Uh, now I can tell you this, that in the 80s and 90s, I used to read a lot about the killings of Puerto Ricanos and uh, Dominicans, etc., on the East Coast, even Chicago. But uh, you don't hear about that that much anymore. But what I'm also saying is that most of the killings now of what we call raza or Latinos, uh, we're really talking about a concentration east of the Mississippi and primarily the greater Southwest. You mean west of the Mississippi? Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, so west of the Mississippi and literally the southwest and I would say the greater southwest. But this is something important for pretty much everyone. The two states with the highest rates of killings, numbers, raw, and numbers, period, is California and Texas. And it's not even close. That is, California is almost double of Texas. But the t top two states are California and Texas. What I'm not getting is national Mexican-American Latino organizations or elected officials understanding that colorism and, and, this, and this history should be an agenda item for them. And even in the discussion of race, we seem to be very awkward. Or, and, and to a certain extent, even not even within conversations within Latinos, we yeah. don't seem to even be able to understand what even to talk about. You know, I'm going to give you an example. When George, what, what am I? Am I correct or incorrect? No, you're correct. Yes. You know, when George Floyd was killed, there was a group out of Arizona. I forget the name of the group, but they gathered a petition of all Rasa organizations nationwide in support of George Floyd. If you read the text, you would have thought this is an issue not for Latinos, but that we have a responsibility to support, you know, George Floyd, the black resistance, etc. So half of that equation is correct. We absolutely should be supporting black resistance, etc. What was missing there is that it's it's almost like there's a mirror, you know, like what they say a smoking mirror, which blinds people. That problem is our problem also, and it's always been there. But the media tropes keep it as, and, and here's the thing that might be the answer you're looking for. See, the media tropes right now are brown people or Latinos, they, they got immigration. No, that's their issue. Police brutality is the issue for the black community. And whether you, no matter what you say or do, no matter what the numbers say, the, the tropes stay the same. That's why I was saying, I think that's across the board and the government is part of that and so is the national media. Locally, I think people understand the difference, but nationally, 
it's still everything black and white. So we're, we're remanded to immigration. So, so Dr. Seedley, and, and this is where, and this is where, you know, and for, and for the, for the folks looking out there, you know, in terms of, of, you know, Raza uh, Chicanos disagreeing and, you know, this is important because Dr. Seedley is an academic and I'm, I'm an academic and we respect each other, but you can, you can, dis, you can disagree. And I'm saying that but sometimes we need to push each other. So yeah, Gustavo yeah. Arellano in his article said, you know, um, a few weeks back, discussing about why Latinos are, are the killings of Latinos is not bringing on attention. He said, he, he, he made a controversial statement basically that, look, we're not making an issue. We're not framing it ourselves, right? And I've gone back and forth on whether I agreed or disagreed with him. But in the case of what you mentioned about the Raza organizations in, 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 in Arizona is that they're not framing it themselves. So if we're not framing it ourselves, how we, we how, how would if A doesn't get it, why would B get it? Why would C get it? You know, and you know, so so what advice would you what would you have done with those organizations so they, they could frame it so that media could at least get a, a correct answer? Yeah. Well, that's what um, I was alluding to. That is the reason this project was started was precisely in response to your observation. That is, again, no matter what we say, no matter what we do, it's still black and white, right? Right. Uh, so it's not a matter of who's at fault, so to speak. It's simply that's the way it is. So how do you change it? That's the real question, right? How do you change it? And so my observation was like, Adam Toledo, it wasn't like a good thing. You know, because any killing is bad, right? But I would say that when until he got killed, it's like we didn't exist. Now it's like everybody wants to know what's going on. And I think so, but see, a lot of us that know the topic have known for quite a while. It's not a recent thing. So the idea of this database was like, we need to do a number of things. All of it is dependent upon the numbers. The data. Without that, people will simply say those are just anecdotes, you know. So the idea is uh, getting this data uh, study completed. And we're about a month away from uh, completing this, and it's for those that know. There's no surprises. For those that don't know, people are going to be uh, what's the word shocked, you know. We're talking in thousands, you know, and we went back to the year 2000. You know, it's not a pretty picture. It's ugly, you know? What are you seeing? I'm sorry? What are you seeing? T tell, tell us well, what... Yeah. Okay, at, at minimum, when we use the lowest number possible, we're talking about an average of over 200 killings per year since the year 2000. So that makes it over 4,000 people have been killed, you know, since the year 2000. That's the low number. The The... What it looks likely is that we probably have about another 2,000 Raza killed on top of that. And the reason that uh, it's hard to get those numbers, like, because there is no centralization. You know who should be doing this work is the FBI. They should be doing all this work, but it's all voluntary. That is, law enforcement doesn't have to report these things. And so all the different databases are either volunteers or perhaps media organizations. And it's very, it's very costly, too. Um, anyway, so we have done this so that there will no longer be an excuse, you know, by anyone, including media. We will be able to point to those numbers. And it's like, how do you have so many thousands of people getting killed and nobody knowing about it? So that there won't be an excuse anymore. They will have the numbers. Now, I think equally powerful... To see part of the group that we created it includes survivors like myself. I'm a survivor myself, but also in, impacted family members. And they, so along with the data, you have the powerful story, the narratives. Um, I think you were asking a question. Dr. Sidley, the, the, uh, uh, when Adam Toledo was, was, was killed, Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo on CNN had an episode. And in that episode, Chris Cuomo and Don Lemon didn't even identify the race and ethnicity of Adam Toledo. They didn't even mention him. 
And they quickly, quickly um, basically stated that the police were correct, whether they are or they were not. But I, I w- it was interesting that only a few days. So, what, what, I mean, very clearly, the police officers in the Toledo case, they were in a Mexican neighborhood in, 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 in Chicago. So the police knew that they were of color, whether they were Latino, Mexican-American, African-American, probably not. But they knew that, right? Yeah. So what, what, what's very interesting about the killing of Adam Toledo is that Adam's race, ethnicity, as a Mexican-American, was removed from the discussion. And, and, and how will your study, the data that, that you're getting and the research, how will that inform that in order to inform Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo that what you did was a horrible thing? I mean, unless I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think what we're talking about is the concept of normalization. That is, this society has accepted the idea that the cop on the street is judge, jury, and executioner. Say, for instance, Adam was guilty of something, okay? That's why we have a judicial system, you know? You have a judicial system, and then you have, you know, the um, prison system, you know, or a juvenile system. So that if somebody is guilty, that's the process, right? But now, because I've heard the same discussion, and I've heard people say, well, why was he out there at night, you know? Or why did he have a gun? And so it's like the logic is like, that somebody that's guilty of anything, you know, from minor to serious, like having Skittles, you know, or having a crucifix in their hand, that that warrants getting killed, you know, and, and that's, so that's why, what I mean about normalization, they should not be killed on the street, they should be, if guilty, they should be taken to court, and then let the process go. But, but Dr. Singley, in, in media, and this is why I'm pushing you a, a little more, in yeah. media, and, and I even ta- attempted to talk to the attorney of, of Adam Toledo, who um, who's a Latina. And one, she wouldn't come on. But two, in her discussion by a Latina attorney, she didn't bring it up either. You know, she didn't bring up, you know, would Adam Toledo have been, have been shot because if he was white? What we're seeing a few, a few weeks back, that you had some police, some, some police officers that were being attacked by, you know, by, by citizens who were white, they didn't get shot. An individual the other day uh, in, in a car, the, uh, the police shoot, shoot dozens of bullets into his car, but, you know, he, nothing occurs. In Washington, D.C., in Washington, D.C., um, you know, whites attacked the Capitol, and it seems to be okay. It, you know, it never occurred, right? So, but, but, with, but with our community... Here in, in Los Angeles, you have Daniel Hernandez uh, who, who was killed, Andres Guajardo who was killed. Race and ethnicity and the brown skin of these individuals doesn't seem to come up. And like, and you mentioned the concept of of being invisible, and and it's it, and we're not connecting the two. Well, there, the invisibilization is one thing, but also dehumanization. They go hand in hand. Okay. Because, like you said, you know if. Uh, Dylan Roof kills nine African Americans, gets captured, and then he's fed Burger King, you know. Whereas Tamir Rice, you know, within a split second, the guy the cop jumps out of the car, shoots him dead. You know, how does that work? You know. Then you also have that other case, right? Kyle Rittenhouse, I think it was, where he shoots and cops. He passes cops with. They give him water. Exactly. So the, the point is, that's why, I'm, that's why I, I use the concept of uh, dehumanization. Who is human and who is not? That's still at work and at play to this very day. Otherwise, what you're asking, that's how, that's how it's explained. There's but no Dr. Sidney, um, going back to Gustavo Arellano's concept, yeah. you know, and it may be a little uncomfortable, but you and I at least uh, you know, we should be able to handle this. Have we... As a, as, a, as a people, Mexican Americans, Central Americans, you know, Latinos, have we accepted the narrative that even if we are discriminated because of brown skin, that we shouldn't speak about it? It's an unspeakable thing in our community, even if we are killed or discriminated for brown skin. Have we accepted the narrative? Yeah. That's why I said at the beginning that it's all of the above. You know, that is, you know, 
a lot of times, I even I got caught up in the idea of like our community's timid because of migration status. But then in Arizona, you know, where I lived for 13 years, that's where that concept of undocumented, unafraid happened. You know, people took off their mask and says, we're undocumented, you want us, come and get us. They got them, but then they got released within a day or two. And after that, everybody stepped forward. So it, is, so it isn't that simple. We're like, we're undocumented, therefore we're timid. No, some of these are very brave. But, but again, it's not one answer. There's, a, there's lots of reasons. I, I think personally, what I mentioned a little while ago, that some people, what they've got caught up in is the idea of those tropes, that immigration is our issue. You know, I think that's where the problem is because all these national organizations, they, that's their focus for a lot of them, right? And they don't focus on law enforcement abuse. However, it's changing now. But Dr. Uh, Dr. Sindy, uh, um, Andres, uh, um, Adam Toledo, Andres Guajardo in Los Angeles, Daniel Hernandez here in Los Angeles, all U.S. citizens, all born here, born in the United States, the issue of brownness of skin color, and I know you don't believe this, but this is important, has nothing to do with immigration. I mean, Dolores Huerta, you know, one of our greatest leaders here, you know, she, she, none of her family touches any immigration. Her family was here since the 18, 1840s. You seem to, we seem to have an issue with the concept of brown, the concept of otherness, which began, like you mentioned, in 1492, but people, but we're not integrating or maybe not integrating, but understanding that immigration status with regard to racialization has, they are connected, but there's no correlation there. I mean, unless I'm incorrect here. Well, what I, you know, in, in, I think in sociology, they came up with the concept of the other. And I always say like, actually, it's not, that's not the most correct term because my study on this topic is the concept of enemy other. In other words, there are some people considered not just other, but enemies. You know, so I think in this category, I know of three groups that are absolutely have always been in that category, and that's indigenous, black, and brown. However, throughout history, Asians have also been in that category, except for modern history. But once the, the, our ex president or the ex president came into power, all of a sudden, Asians are again part of that same story of dehumanization, right? All the rise and all the attacks against Asian peoples, you know, it's the same logic at work. They, they're enemy outsiders, you know, they don't belong here. So that's how we've all been treated. So that's, that's I think, the, the, what weaves, you know, who belongs here, who doesn't, you know? African Americans, for the most part, most of them, by upwards of 90%, have all hundreds of years of roots here. And they're still considered enemy others, you know? They don't belong here. Same thing. And, of course, even Native peoples, even more so. <laughs> you know, like, we've been here thousands of years, and still Native people are considered, like, we don't belong here. You know, again, enemy other. So I think Mexicanos inherited somewhere in between the two, or perhaps even more so just the indigenous idea of, like, we're vanquished peoples, peoples that don't belong in this country. And so, therefore... That's why you have this judicial system. See, a lot of people look at the law enforcement as the issue. To me, that's part of the issue. But the real issue for me has always been the judicial system. Because, you know, when you look at all the reforms that people look at, you know, that they're proposing, et cetera, et cetera. I said, in my eyes, unless you have a cop doing 40 years to life, there ain't nothing going to change. Because every time something is created, they learn how to bend the rules and go around it. You know, there's, you can't bend the idea of somebody doing 40 to life. So Dr. Seedley, you are in mass communication. If, 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 you, if you were to give advice to the attorney of Adam Toledo, to Don Lemon, to Chris Cuomo, and to those that you say have the petition in Arizona, what would you say to them? What would, be, what would have been the other half of the letter? How should they improve their presentation with regard to their client? How would how how should um, CNN have done the presentations um, with regard to the killing of Adam Adam Toledo? Educate them with your words right now 
on what they should have done. Well, see, one of the things that, that we should all remember is that when you have a legal case, you know, they're very specific, very individual, right? So I think, like, as you said, as researchers, as academics, we're looking at something bigger, you know? See, because I'm not going to tell an attorney how to do their case, obviously, you know, because, again, they know the specifics of what happened or didn't happen, et cetera, et cetera. But I think as a researcher, you can step back and examine. It's like, is it a coincidence, as, as you said earlier, you have all these white people storming the Capitol and they all are given uh, free passes to leave, right? If that had been a black or brown mob, you know, there would have been a lot of weapons used, you know? We know that, you know? Mm -hmm. So the, the point being is that, like, I, I think it's more applicable to, say, Don Lemon and the media, you know, as opposed to the individual attorneys because of those specificities. I would say is that, like, we should all be conscious of that sometimes some issues are not black and white, you know? And I think if in this society, almost every negative statistic or positive statistics, there's three groups that are always at the top or always at the bottom, you know? And whether it's issues of poverty, unemployment, and on and on, health, access to health, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's just something that we should be conscious. And so when people are looking at solutions, it's like we don't need three separate efforts, you know? It's like it should just be one effort, you know? That national conversation on race should be all inclusive. Uh, because again, we're not, we're not like, to me, it's not a competition. These three groups are equally affected. And if anything, I, I did mention indigenous peoples, American Indians, they actually have the highest rates of killings against them from law enforcement. So it's like, how do you invisibilize that? You know, in other words, the entire country here begins with indigenous peoples. So it's like, it starts from kindergarten. That is, we should be teaching the history of this continent, you know, not like some fantasy founding father story, you know. There is a history here, and we should teach it. And everybody, media, government, the schools, should not, uh, I guess we should look at that as the trash bin of history, the black and white view of history. That, that belongs in another century. So, Dr. Sigley, what, 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 what I find interesting is that as, I, as I look at the agendas, for instance, here in California, the California Latino legislative agenda, and if I probably looked at the Arizona, New Mexico, you know, uh, you know, agendas, if I look at the agendas of Naleo, Hispanic Caucus, this issue of understanding the issues of race within brown communities, and, and I absolutely agree in terms of the national agenda uh, on race. But if brown, the brown communities, Latino communities, Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, if though if the discussion within these communities isn't even happening, and it's hap or it's happening in a way that overemphasizing um, kind of European, you know, kind of colonial superiority, how do we even expect the media, you know, in this situation represented by the era of Chris Cuomo and Don Lemon? with Adam Toledo, how do we expect them to understand what we ourselves aren't even having the discussion? And that's one of the reasons I wanted you on this show, yeah. because you're bringing data, you're bringing stuff that they could, folks could put into their press releases, their agendas. You get what I mean? And, it's, and, it's, and, and, and that's, that's a concern. I think you know the answer in the sense that, you know, I know your work, you've done past work on ethnic studies, Brasa studies, you know, in my opinion, it'd be like, why do you think they're trying to get rid of it? You know, everywhere, from California to Texas to New Mexico, Arizona, everywhere, you know? There's a reason, because it creates consciousness. And in this society, it, that's why I say, I think it's, people have got lazy, because it's easy to do black-white. It's easy, you know? And to be able to know that indigenous history, Mexican history, Central American history. That's a, that takes a little bit more time. It takes research, and I think people, you know, they've gotten comfortable. And part of it. So how do you do? How do you raise consciousness? One is through the media, but also through the educational system. You know, we fight, we teach, you know, we research, only to be rebuffed at the at the state level. You know, to be told, no, you you can only teach American history. 
You know that, that, and I remember when we spoke years ago, that most people didn't know that the issue there literally was about indigeneity. That is, they were okay. The state of Arizona was okay with teaching 1492 to the present. In other words, three ships show up. You can teach that, but you cannot teach pre-1492. So what are they saying? They're saying that who we are does not count, does not matter. You know, it's like we're being that. That's another form of invisibilization. So, so I think what we're doing today, you know, because I really, that's why I mentioned Adam Toledo. Like, I have never seen the interest as high as today because I've been contacted by pretty much all the media. Uh, and uh, not only that, the organizations. Because, see, the organizations, the national organizations, should have been doing this work. Right. But, 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 you, but you know the reason they should have been doing this work is because the government is not doing this work. It's the government's responsibility. You know, right now we have, you know, researchers doing the work that the government should be doing because they should be requiring every law enforcement agency to account for every shooting, for every killing, for all the brutality. But they're not doing it. So that means it's up to us, the organizations, to push. They haven't been doing that. Now they are. You know, so I, because I, again, I, I'm, I've been pleasantly surprised that everybody wants to come on board because I think they probably deep in the back of their psyche, you know, that they, have always wanted to do this, but maybe their sponsors, whomever, advertisers, collaborators, you know, maybe they kind of discourage that. But now I don't think there's an option because, you know, they're just like Adam Toledo, I, you know, I'm old enough and you're probably old enough to remember uh, Santos Rodriguez out of Dallas when he was killed. He was 12 years old by the Dallas police, you know, uh, when a kid like Tamir Rice. You know, uh, when you have somebody that age, 12 years old, 13, even 14, Emmett Till was 14, you know, when you have somebody that age getting killed, that shocks the conscience, you know, and it's like, I think this is one of those watershed moments, you know, it's like when Ruben Salazar was killed, you know, the journalist, right, but in this case, it's a little kid, and it's like, all of a sudden, people are like, hey, has this been going on elsewhere, you know, how big is the problem, people are finally asking those questions. And I, and I think what you said are, to the readers, to the listeners, Brad, that we should be looking at solutions. You know, where do we go from here? You know, so one of the things that we're proposing is having a, um, a national summit on November 1st and November 2nd. This was suggested by um, one of our uh, national organizations to do it on that day because people's consciousness will be focused on Dia de los Muertos, the altares, you know? So I think that it's it's the right time, and people are going to come on board. So we'll have the, the altares, the ceremonies, and the conference. So, Dr. Sindhi, so um, when the news, we will be at the conference on November 1st. Do you know where it's going to be? No, it, it's, it has to be virtual still. Okay. So the we one will, will be physical. You know? We will always be, but, you know, to the viewers outside, because I do think that we have a, um, that we have a responsibility, specifically you and I. You know, both of us have our, our, our PhDs. And, and one of the reasons we're doing this show, you know, to Gustavo Arellano's this point, we have a responsibility as a community to have these dialogues um, publicly. They may be awkward. We may make mistakes. It's irrelevant. But what I would say to the viewers, write down your questions for Dr. Seatley in this show down here in the comments, Dr. C because the, the, Dr. Seatley, the, the results of your study will be out in approximately a month, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. And I invite you to come on back on the show. Will you come back on the show? Absolutely. And I okay. think one of the demographers should probably be on there also. Oh, and what we'll do is, if you're listening to this show, put your questions for Dr. Saintly in the comments, okay? We're going to use this show as an organizing show. So before the, or as simultaneously, concurrently, whichever big word you like, we will, we will do a show going over the study specifically, but also we will take time to answer your comments, okay? So if you're watching this show, put a comment. If you're, if you're watching on this device, go to YouTube, Well in the News, Watch this, ep watch this episode. Not only do we want you to press subscribe, you can't watch and not press subscribe, um, and, but because we want to build this virtual conference on November 1st, it's a something very big, but everyone watching, let me just be very clear. You have a specific responsibility 
it to make sure that the dialogue, however uncomfortable, privately with groups, to be part of the solution. So I want to thank you, Dr. Sinley. We're not we're not done, but you're taking because a lot of times as academics, I'm a Chicano Studies academic. You are a, as well. You know, academics, we're not pushing the envelope enough. I mean, w would you agree? Oh, exactly. That's why I'm doing this work. And but see, like I said, people are are ready. You know. I think six months ago they were not, but something has happened and people want to step forward, mainly because, you know, this has always been part of our issue. At times people are silent about it, but people have memory, you know? So Dr. Seatley, you get the final word. Um, well, I just, I just uh, we're going to be doing recruitment and advertising, so to speak, uh, regarding November 1 and November 2, because see, part of, the long-term proposal is that, as I mentioned, if you have a cop doing 40 years to life, that will stop the brutality. Until that happens, we also have a plan to go to the international court at the Hague, the criminal court, because that, that court is designed for when the courts at home do not work. And I can tell you, 8,000 people have been killed since Michael Brown. How many cops are doing hard time? as a result of those 8,000 killings. You could probably put them in one hand, you know? And and they'll probably get out, just like the, the killer of Oscar Grant. The guy got out in, I think it was nine months, maybe 11 at the most. In other words, until you see 40 to life, nothing's gonna change. So we're gonna go to the International Criminal Court. Even we know how that works, they'll probably reject us, but we're gonna keep going and going so that people know that this is happening. But Dr. Seeley, if someone who's watching this wants to get a hold of you because they want to be helpful to you. Yeah. How what, Do you have some websites, emails, information so that they can contact you or help you in the organizing? I will send it to you later. You know, I have to get on this other interview right now. Okay. So I will, I will send you the, uh, I mean, you can get, use my email, but we have an actual website, all that, you know, like all the, all the social media. Okay. I'll send that to you. But okay. in terms of my email, you can write to me too. It's X column at gmail.com and we will put that up we will put that up um okay. viewers i, I want to thank dr dr seatley from from um, university of arizona mexican american studies uh, department joining us today um and uh again press the subscribe button button uh join us dr seatley we will see you um in a month or so when the study is out and we will build to to that conference viewers all right, Vitrucha en la lucha. Adiós. Thank you very much.